Hey everyone, this is part 7 of I'm a Monster Created by the Government. If you missed any of the earlier parts, they'll be linked down below in the description. Enjoy. Site 12, February 7th, 2002. Good morning, you're Dr. West, correct? Said the man behind me. His hair done flat with a gel. It's a pleasure to meet you. I am. I'm assuming you're my new colleague, I replied, rubbing my eyes as I let a yawn escape my mouth, exhausted from the previous night's work. Well, I wasn't hired to mop floors, he joked, his chuckle fading as he saw that I was unamused by his attempted humor, along with the grip on his suitcase tightening. Well, I know you already went over this with the director of operations, but... Please tell me your full name, and then hand me proof of your credentials and schooling. I just want to be thorough. I followed up. The man frantically reached inside his suitcase, pulling out a slightly crumpled stack of papers, as well as multiple college degree certificates. The name is Dr. Jonathan R. Dilliard. He nodded with a smile. I scanned his papers and identification finding myself to be slightly impressed when I saw that he had obtained four PhDs. Only one less than I had. But I was still confident that my intellect was superior. It seems like you've got your life together, I proclaimed. You are aware that this job will require you to spend extended periods of time away from your home and relatives. Immediately, Jonathan's face sunk as if I had just informed him that I was going to drop a brick on his foot. His sudden sorrow was obvious, and not that he made any attempt to conceal it. Um, that's actually kind of why I'm here. Mia responded, scratching his head awkwardly. My ex-wife really doesn't want a thing to do with me, and I lost my daughter recently. Just thought that maybe being productive could help give me a distraction. I really need it at the moment. The room fell silent between the two of us, Jonathan seemingly trying to hold back tears in his eyes. I didn't feel like having him get said tears all over the sterilized floor, so I attempted to intervene, stopping him from letting the waterworks out in the lab. Sorry to hear that, I replied quickly. I can show you to your station over here, Jonathan. He smiles, his mood seemingly lifted as he held out a hand for me to shake. My distraction worked, for the time being. You can call me John, it makes more sense and it's quicker. What are we working on today, Doctor? Present day. Aria, John, Jenny, and I all exited the chapel. The four of us confused and shocked by what we had seen. John had brought the thick book that was resting on the lectern with him, wanting to use it and study it as evidence. We should get back to the spa, he announces. See if we can make more sense of what's in here. I'm starting to wonder if we're getting played, Jenny adds, her implication clear. If it is true, we need to find and stop them before they finish their creation. This five-headed witch could have unparalleled power. Even too much for me and Arya to fight. I chimed in. Where did they go? Arya inquires, shifting her gaze to the three of us. Not a clue. John responds as we approach the truck. All I know is that it doesn't feel right that they would have left this book behind. Wouldn't that mean that they may have already finished what they were doing? What if the five-headed witch already exists? We will deal with it when necessary, I said climbing up into the back of the truck. For now, we must prepare for the coming conflict. Jenny, you want to drive? John asked, shifting over to the passenger side door. Sure, I don't see why not, she smiles, flashing John an excited grin. With Arya and I in the back and John and Jenny in the front, we begin the short journey back to the spa, John reading the book as we go along striving to learn as much as he could. Hey, I found some pages with actual coherent writing, 
He turns and sticks his head out the window toward Arya and me. It's not completely perfect by any means, but by that and the combination of the illustrations, it appears that this five-headed witch is made from a deceased girl's corpse, and then four other heads of grown women are added on. The heads added on cannot be related to the main head by blood. It sounds pretty freaking weird. I ain't heard about nothing like that before. No tales in the Bible or anything I've read. Jenny furthers. John then turned and spread the ends of the book wide, attempting to show off its contents to both Arya and I. He was right, and the illustration on the current page depicted a drawing of two different women being burnt alive on metallic slabs over a fire, confirming that Jenny was supposed to become a victim when we had stumbled upon her and the black-robed people. Although particularly Arya and I had suspicions about Jenny's integrity, it was now clear to both me and her that she truly was close to ending up as nothing more than a pawn of the black-robed people's evil scheme. Why create a witch? Arya asked, also attempting to get a good look at the book, still not completely understanding its contents. Not sure, John responds, but I just know that it's not going to be good. Maybe it's to get a leg up on the government or something. Surely, we're not the only ones who know about what they're doing. Well, they got quite a reputation for using the things that go bump in the night as their slaves. You think they might want to do that with her when she's brought to life? Jenny proposed. Even she seemed disturbed by the words that left her mouth. More than likely, after Helena and the Pine Runners, they will use and manipulate any creature that they can find. We need to stop them as soon as possible, I answer. Whoa, the Pine Runners? You mean those things that were at the chapel? I like that name. Why didn't you tell me sooner, Bron? John asks as a smile emerges, reaching out of the window in order to give me a fist bump, which I had now become more accustomed to. We were occupied, I respond slowly, both of us separating our knuckles. John retracts his torso back inside the truck. Arya and I simply exchange looks as the vehicle bumps and thrashes along the rough road. Bron, she says, her stout still possessing remnants of green mossy blood from the encounter with the Pine Runners. Yes, I reply, my claws resting against the outside of the truck. Do you think that one day we will find a place to live? Forever? No more running or fighting. Only when we need to eat. I'm not certain, I begin. We have issues that need to be dealt with and until they are, they will follow us no matter how far we run or journey. Only when we finish dealing with these problems can we truly live without having to constantly be on guard. It is a frustrating revelation, yes, but it will one day be worth all of this bloodshed. Arya then raises her right claw in the air, signaling for me to do the same. I lift my right arm, spreading my fingers and place my claw against hers. The both of us don't utter a single word for a length of several seconds. We simply stare, not moving a muscle or an inch, sitting there as if we were nothing more than the trees. Hey, if you two want to hop out and stretch your legs, go ahead, we're almost here. John's voice slices through the silence, causing both of us to snap to attention. I turn my head to the right, and immediately something feels off. The spa is coming into view, and as we approach it and from the outside, it seems just as how we had left it. But I begin to pick up a multitude of foreign scents, scents that were not previously present near this area. Not long after I get wind of it, Arya notices it as well, her posture shifting into a more combative stance. It was easy to conclude when she was becoming defensive. Wait, I tell her quietly before leaning over towards the cab of the pickup. Let me go first, I say as Jenny finishes parking the vehicle. Something is wrong. We are not alone. What? John inquires with a potent desire for an answer. Just wait out here, all of you, I command quietly. 
slowly inching my way out of the back of the truck on all fours. And I then began to crawl my way up to the front steps of the spa, keeping as quiet as possible, not even letting my claws click as I move. The scents become much more potent as I approach closer to the main door. I can hear breathing. The breathing of multiple entities. One of them in particular is heavier than the rest. I still don't stand once I'm just inches from the door, no. Instead, I continue to crawl, placing a fingernail on the tip of the doorknob. Three, two, one. Immediately, I grab the door and I tore it off with lightning speed, dashing inside and being met with the sight I had dreaded the most, a sight that I knew was only going to end in friction. There stood the black-robed people, all in a lion formation staring at the door, and standing in the middle of them was Yubel holding the torch. He seemed quite pleased, like a malevolent cryptid who had just caught a prey item. I wasted no time and began to lunge at them, only to be blasted backwards by some strange, unseen force, and slamming into the wall next to the main door, rocks and marble breaking apart from my impact. And then, something completely unexpected took place. The material from the wall began to move, almost like chains, wrapping themselves around my arms and keeping me restrained and unable to carry out my vicious attack. I fought and roared as I attempted to struggle free, but something was increasing the strength of the material, preventing even me from breaking free of its hold. It wasn't simple marble or brick, not anymore. There was some sort of matter manipulation going on, but I was unaware of what was doing it. Jenny, Arya, and John all darted inside. Arya lunged at Yubel but was quickly stopped when Yubel waved the torch in her face, causing her to stumble back due to her fear of fire and meet the same fate as me. The floor rose up and wrapped around her limbs. She fought, struggled, and howled the same as me, but it was just as futile now also being prohibited from moving. I must say, you are all quite the formidable bunch, Yuo began. A sickening laugh accompanies his sentence. My spies have told me you defeated all of our guards at the chapel. Very impressive. But you're all still a bunch of pretentious fools, thinking that you can defeat us so easily. You all know nothing. John looked over at me. His face boiling red with rage. The vessels in his forehead had threatened to burst with every exhale that had escaped his nostrils. Is this him? He asked, his voice restrained to keep what was left of his composure intact. I nodded my head to answer as the makeshift chains tightened themselves even harder, pressing itself harshly against my tissue and bones. Ah, I believe we have yet to meet. I'm Yubel. He taunts, shifting his attention toward John. It's a pleasure. I'll kill you all. Arya erupts, still attempting to fight to get free, her struggle proving no more effective than mine. Oh, believe me, I don't doubt that. Yubo responds. Considering what you did to some of my brothers and sisters when we attempted to take the girl. He punctuates, pointing at Jenny to clarify. Leave us well alone. We did nothing to you. Y'all are nothing but a group of wusses, she countered. And then, as if on cue, about a square meter of the ceiling above crashes downwards, creating a dusty hole, and through it came another entity, one that was unlike any other I had seen before. It slowly levitated downward, demonstrating that it had the ability to fly. Everyone's eyes widened at the sight in front of us, especially John, who proceeded to fall to his knees out of sheer emotional agony. It was the five-headed witch. There, in the flesh, the black-robed people were successful. They had finished their horrific creation. We were too late to stop them. Nalita, what have they done to you? John cried out reaching his hands outward as he tried to get back to his feet, tears beginning to burrow into his sweater. I soon made the connection. 
The man head at the top, the one controlling the others of the five-headed witch, was John's previously thought to be deceased daughter, Nalita. Her hair was much more torn and loose than what I assumed it was when she was still human. Her flesh appeared to have grown reptilian-like scales. Her teeth had barely remained intact as I spotted far too much of her gums. While the eyes of her head had glowed a light lime-green color, the others did not. In fact, none of the other heads seemed to have been functioning at all, which begged the question of why they were there to begin with. Even through all these monstrous changes, John was still able to recognize her. Yubel slowly marched toward John as he sat there on the floor, remaining confident in his every step, handing the torch off to another black-robed member as he bent on to speak to the distraught man. It seems you two have been reunited. I would be careful of the witch, though, as she's quite radioactive. He proclaims with a cackle. Not a single ounce of remorse or empathy in his tone. Without warning, John lunges upward and punches Yubel in the chin, then attempting to follow it up by choking him, only for Yubel to viciously knee John in the stomach and send him back onto the ground. Yubel was a much bigger man than John. His blows more powerful and yet his movements were also quicker, much more calculated and coordinated. John vomited a bit onto the floor as a result of the blow, right near Yubel's foot. I'm gonna kill you, he declares relentlessly, despite his circumstances, proceeding to use his sleeve to wipe some of the leftover throw-up away. You will leave him be, I shout, or I will devour you in front of your men while you're still alive. I punctuate by motioning my gaze towards Yubel. Jenny attempts to join in and help, only to be slammed against the ceiling by the five-headed witch's telekinetic abilities and not unconscious. I pick up the sound of something snapping inside her as she collides back with the floor. Yuba wipes blood from his mouth as he turns to walk away. John attempts to get up and lunge at him once more, but is quickly met with Yuba's elbow to the face, the cartilage in his nose twisting as the impact takes place. Yubel then turns and grabs John by his shirt collar, raising him up into the air as he spits to the side. You are so lucky that I can't kill you, he snarls. I can't understand how you were stupid enough to believe me when I said we've never met before. Well, not personally anyway. But I know you remember that night, John. The night that she had been taken. That was me. It was us. I had sent Helena to do the job. Of course, she was only a puppy in comparison to what she was, before your hideous blue friend over there had killed her. A slightly different fur color and everything. Yubel rambles on. John cut Yubel's sentence short as he proceeded to spit a collection of blood in his face. Yubel recoiled, pulling his fist back and delivering another blow, this time out of genuine rage rather than self-defense. John's completely dazed, his head slowly leaning from side to side on his neck as he tries to maintain consciousness. But through all his abuse and being beaten, he does not bow or yield once. Yubel drops John to the floor, causing him to groan as his back makes contact with the floor. Blood still poured from his nose and mouth as his left eye began to swell up his fingers twitching as if he wants to grab onto something. With John in his nearly unconscious state, Yubel turns his attention over to me. Walking in front of where I was restrained with a smug smile spread across his face, straining his neck to look up at me and meet my eyes with his. You, I can't even begin to tell you how truly worthless you are. I will avenge Lena and make sure that you die the most horrific death possible. I will. He suddenly pauses, an expression of sinister mischief emerging. Something in Yubel seemed to snap, some sort of revelation or corrupt plan. His silence to withhold the information was maddening, but I know that he only wanted me to grow more angry, to prove his point that I was nothing more than a merciless killer that acted only on instinct, and instinct alone. Actually, 
he says much more quietly. I have a much better idea. He turns around, putting his arms behind his back once again. He marches over to the five-headed wedge, who was still levitating slightly in the air in front of the other black robes. Yubel signals and the two lock eyes. She gives off a slight bow of submission, conveying that Yubel was truly the one in charge. Do what you please with, Miss Jenny, but we need John alive. He is your lifeline and anchor. But banish the blue one and the Wendigo to the Annihilation Realm. They are two savage monsters after all. It's where they belong. But master... The witch replies, her voice echoing off the walls of the spa as her words leave her lips. That will weaken me. It requires an extensive amount of power. Are you sure you want this? Yubel immediately scrunches his features, indicating that he is displeased with her response. I know that. Now do it, he commands. They are nothing but threats and should be dealt with as such. Don't be such a whiny coward. No, do not listen to him. I begin to erupt. He's a liar, a deceiver, and he's using you. I know the experience all too well. Once you are of no use to him, he will throw you out, cast you aside. You are nothing to him. You must believe me. The five-headed witch simply ignores me as most lions would ignore insects. She raises her arms into the air, the heads on the ends of each beginning to open their mouth. A sort of purple energy beam spills out, one beam going to me and the other to Arya, quickly engulfing us like flames around a burning tree. Goodbye, Thon. Oh, was it? Ubel asked sarcastically, waving his right hand from side to side as he keeps that same, arrogant smirk plastered on his face. Every ounce of me wanted to tear his head right from his shoulders, make him experience the pain that he had caused so many others, so many innocents, both man and cryptid alike. The purple beam soon surrounds my vision, in fact. It stimulates all of my senses. I can hear screams, battle cries, shrieks of terror, and existential dread. The wails of those who had fell victim to fatal wounds, be it from battle or torture. I see all across space and time, timelines of not just Earth, but other planets, civilizations, and societies. Wars, epic conflicts and conquests, diverse leaders marching and commanding their armies, the slaughter of millions, billions, and even trillions, all at once. I smell the scent of alien creatures, blood, the smoke of fires. Fires started by large-scale destruction and mayhem, chaos spreading its way across the cosmos like a plague, tearing through worlds and planets in its wake. Soon enough, it all comes to a slow, fading end. I find myself looking at what appears to be some sort of sandstone floor, my arms and legs still unable to be moved. I tilt my head up. In front of me, I see a wall made from the same material with a multitude of weapons hung upon it. Swords, shields, all kinds of alien-shaped blades and instruments of war, some of which contained dry blood on them. And due to the diversity of the colors, it seemed to be from more than one entity. On the wall where I was, was a small lineup of alien creatures chained up against it, including me. Some sort of light blue energy field surrounding the chains, conveying the idea that breaking out of them wasn't a matter of simple strength. I had a few of them wrapped around both my arms and legs, giving me the answer as to why I wasn't able to mobilize. The three creatures with me consisted of first, a large brute of some sort. He was even taller than me, significantly taller reaching around to nine feet. His arms alone were the size of a fit human male's thighs. His skin was a dark green rock texture, some parts of it glowing a lighter green through the cracks. He possessed no hair anywhere. His fingers were long, far out of proportion with his hands, but they weren't claws exactly, and they looked much too dull. 
not that it seemed necessary for him to have them. His most noticeable feature was the fact that he had four mouths. Two where his cheeks should have been and one in the front and at the back of his head. The mouth in the front, sitting below a strange display of one single yellow glowing eye. The entity second furthest down and right next to the four mouth brute was what appeared to be a snake at first. His skin being a similar pattern to that of a boa constrictor from Earth, and he was seemingly no different other than his enormous size. However, I noticed on the end of his tail sat a trident formation of biological blades made from his own exoskeleton. On his sides, closer to his head, he had two almost human hands jetting out. They were almost the correct shape but were in the colors of his skin. His mouth was covered by a strange looking device, preventing him from opening it or speaking. Finally, the being who sat next to me, she was humanoid, actually looking somewhat like a younger version of Dr. West. Although much taller, probably approaching 7 feet, only a few inches off from Arya's height. But the more supernatural aspects of her came into view quickly. She transformed her left arm into a blade made completely from blue fire. And when I say blue fire, I truly mean the entire flame itself was a slightly dark, deep, ocean-colored blue. She sliced and swung her arm at the energy chains keeping her restrained. Her powers seeming to have no effect on them whatsoever. They were clearly made to withstand attacks from an array of creatures. They have truly improved these restraints' integrity, she complains. It was not like this last time. Arya, I called through the chambers. Arya, where are you? Are you alright? The blue-flamed woman looked over at me curiously, tilting her head as if to examine my figure, completely intrigued by my presence. And who might you be? Where are you from? She asks, putting her flames away and transforming her arms back into what they were previously. Braun, I told her, haste present in my tone. My name is Braun. I need to get back to Earth. I need to help my friends. I cannot stay here. The blue flamed woman raises an eyebrow, looking me up and down as she bites her lip. You're better looking than the rest. Is this Arya your lover? Man, what is this earth that you speak of? She continues to probe, sending me a never-ending barrage of question after question. Earth is my home, I reply. I need to depart from here. Uh, would you know how to escape? Well, only the orchestrator decides if anyone leaves this place. You must fight for what you want here in the Annihilation Realm, Bron. I've been the last remaining champion more than once and I don't intend to be defeated now. Just as I was about to question her on who this mysterious orchestrator is, two more entities filed into the room, both at the same height, around seven and a half feet tall, bulky and well-built. I assumed them to be the guards of some sort. They both possessed a red, marbled textured skin with no eyes anywhere to be seen. They wore slick silver armor and carried large spears, electricity flowing at the very top of each. I can smell what seems to resemble smoke coming from their bodies, like they had just escaped a raging fire. The next match will begin shortly. You four will be up. Please give us your contender names, the guard on the left requested. The four-mouthed brute immediately roars, wanting to be the first to answer his base nearly shaking the structure itself. Genjin. The snake beast says nothing, his mouth still covered with a device. So the guards just simply assign him a name instead. You will be known as a Constrictor, they say simultaneously. So, it was intelligent to assume it had been his first time. The blue flamed woman jumps eagerly, rallying her restraints in her fit of joy. The guards don't reciprocate, of course. She is alone in her mental prosperity, but it doesn't bother her one bit. I am Thaw. She vocalizes rather loudly. You two should be aware of this by now. And then the guards finally turn their attention to me. Despite lacking discernible eyes, it was clear they could see me. 
They were pointing their heads exactly in my direction. It seems that their vision was functioning supernaturally, but this wasn't anything that I hadn't seen before. And you, the one on the right demands. Be quick about it, the current match is almost over. The orchestrator wants you all to be on time for the event. Let me go now, I need to return to Earth, I snarl, wrestling with the restraints. The guards don't react to my outburst, merely standing there like statues as I attempt to lunge forward at them. Fine beast, the left one begins. We shall give you a name. You will be... Thaw interrupts the guard, cutting him off swiftly before his sentence could be completed. His title is Braun. Respect it. She commanded the both of them. The guard to the right walks down to Genjin, holding out his electrical spear and placing it against the energy chains restraining him. After a couple of seconds, the chains deactivated and Genjin stepped away from the wall, walking over to the weapons wall and beginning to equip armor, as well as a curved sword. You could determine a lot about someone by how they chose their weaponry. The guards repeated the process with both Constrictor and Thaw, following Genjin's lead to go over to the weapons wall and gear up. The guards get to me, placing their spears against my chains and letting the current flow. They had burst and crackles for a few seconds before the chains were loose and I was free. A foolish move on their end. That's what I thought at the time. Immediately, I attacked the guard to the left, slashing through his chest plate with one of my claws, before following it up by grabbing him and lifting him high into the air at rapid speed causing his head to go straight through the ceiling of the room and crash back down. Rubble from the impact rolling along the floor beneath us. Where is Arya, the Wendigo? When I start to order, but my tirade is cut short by the unbearable sensation of thousands of volts of electricity entering my veins. My burn shouts in agony as I'm electrocuted, burying my teeth as I attempt to grip the nearest object with my claws, only for there to be nothing to grab onto. In a temporarily weakened state, the other guard bends over and lifts me up off the floor, putting me over his shoulder as the other creatures watch, shaking their heads in disapproval at what I had done. Save your strength for the Annihilation Arena, Blue Man. Genjin booms proudly as he puts the chest plate of his armor on. Usually, I would have been able to shake off the wound by now and get back to the fight but the agency had specifically designed me to be vulnerable to electricity as a contingency. So therefore, my healing process took a little bit longer when it came to this method of being wounded. His name is Braun. Thaw erupts at Genjin, transforming both her arms into her signature blue fire rods, shooting him a threatening look after doing so. But I figured that Genjin was right. Fighting the guards would only create unnecessary chaos. The one that I needed to find was the orchestrator. He seems to be the one in power from the words of the others. And also the one that could help me get back to Earth. Back to where I so desperately needed to be. Not to mention, they probably have enough forces to overwhelm me if I tried. All of this was rather crass. But if it was what I needed to do in order to save my friends, it had to be done. By any means necessary. I demanded that the guard carry me drop me, into which he obliged, seemingly doing it according to the protocol rather than his own personal concern for me, not that I expected it to exist. Through what resembled a long hallway, the guards led Genshin, Thaw, Constrictor, and I forward, a massive burst of light beaming between the walls as we had marched. No armor or weapons for you, Braun, Thaw questioned curiously skipping forward in order to keep pace with me. No, it only slow my efforts, I respond, keeping my eyes locked on what was ahead. Thaw smiled, rapidly blinking her eyes in my direction. Wow, such a warrior, comes her slow reply, her smile still present all the way through. I didn't pick up any strange scents, not ones that weren't already there. But what I did hear was the immensely loud sound of excited cheers and cries. Voices coming from thousands upon thousands of different entities. 
it was a lot to adapt to at first, but my ears would soon adjust. Eventually, the hallway ended, and the guards stopped, one standing on each side holding their spears, trying their best to look menacing. As I marched past, the one on the left grabbed me by the arm. He was also the one that I had attacked when I was at first freed from my restraints. Your arrogance will get you killed, and I for one can't wait to watch, he growls, still bitter from the earlier events, the malice in his delivery less than subtle. You are nothing more than a cannon fodder, watch your tongue, I snarl back, looking him directly into his eyeless face. The guard on the right then proceeded to remove the mask restraining Constrictor's mouth, as I yanked my arm away. Men, do not touch me again, or your spear will not save you, I warned, raising my claws to strengthen the threat. The four of us exited through the hallway into a massive-sized circular arena. All sorts of different species sat in the stands above, thousands of entities all chanting and roaring for the action to begin, anticipating the inevitable showdown. Towards the south end of these spectator seats sat a reptilian-like creature. His face and body resembled that of a Komodo dragon. Scales ran all across his gray skin as he stared down at me, his tail moving back and forth in unfiltered excitement. It was difficult to determine his height due to the fact that he was seated, but I guessed him to be around seven and a half feet tall. Two guards stood firmly on either side of his chair, which was significantly bigger than the rest, allowing him a more grandiose aspect to his presence. That's him, Thaw says, leaning over to me, pointing at the large lizard. The orchestrator. Welcome, contenders, he announces proudly through a device that resembled a microphone. I would like to welcome back our returning champion, Thaw, so far undefeated. But this day's event is special. It appears that we have a new warrior in the crowd and going bare as well. What a brave soul. Could you tell us your name, Blue One? He asked, excluding the others to focus on me specifically. Most of the stadium quieted after he requested it. The majority of the creatures leaning forward in their seats, waiting so desperately for my name to be announced. My name is Braun. I can't stay here. I need to get back to Earth. My friends will die if I do not. I don't have time for pointless battles. The orchestrator stares blankly for a second, gathering his thoughts. Well, first off, I would like to say that I love your name. Braun. It just has the perfect flow to its utterance. Power is strength. I'm rambling. He trails off. Well, Bron, I will inform you that I'm a fair ruler here in the Annihilation Realm, and I'm already pleased with your courage and conviction. Should you survive this trial and come out as the last one alive, I will grant you not only access back to your home world, but more power than you could ever hope for. The citizens here have been waiting quite some time for this match to begin, some of which would like to see Thaw dethroned. Although he didn't seem trustworthy, not in the slightest, it was currently my only option. I did consider attempting to scale the walls to break out, only to see that they were also lined with some sort of thin, red energy field, and I had no idea how fatal it truly was, but it was clear that it would cause intense pain at the least, acting as a deterrent to keep contenders from escaping. The crowd began to chant my name as the orchestrator riled them up, beings and oddities from all over different parts of existence rising in order to contribute to the quickly rising volume. This must have been a part of what I saw and sensed in the purple energy while I was being transported here. The citizens here always appreciate new faces, the orchestrator adds. Bring out the other lineup. Through what was an identical hallway on the opposite side of the arena, emerged what I assumed were more candidates for the fight. One was what looked to be a three-headed tiger of some sort, 
except the pigmentation of the creature was a darker blue, similar to mine. On each head, above his noses, he possessed a horn like that of a rhinoceros. To the far left was a small, human-looking girl. Her black hair was done in a ponytail, and seemed to be wearing a white dress. The young girl possessed three eyes instead of two, that rested above her nose, all of which were a void like black, even darker than her hair. Her hands hung by her sides, a black sludge substance coating her fingers. The second to last was what could only be described as a larger version of one of the pine runners that we had run into, the creatures outside guarding the chapel. He was much, and I truly mean much bigger than his earth relatives, only just an inch or two shorter than Genjin. And then, there was the final opponent, the one that I had focused my attention on the most. It was Arya. Like me, she had chosen to equip no armor and or weapons, simply intending to use her raw strength and power in the coming conflict, as well as the three-eyed little girl with the black sledge in her hands. She kept an oddly optimistic smile plastered on her face as she sized the rest of us up. The orchestrator said that I could leave if I was the last one standing, meaning this would be far more complicated than what I had originally assumed. It was going to take more than a simple battle to get out of here. While I was appreciative of his courtesy, I was angry that most of the cryptids and creatures in this arena did not want to be here and he was using them as nothing more than his personal entertainment. There are no rules or regulations on how any of you fine creatures choose to use your abilities. Alliances and betrayals are welcomed, but as most of you know, only one may be left standing, said the orchestrator. The other six stared each other down, but Arya and I shared a glance of mutual understanding knowing we both were concocting a similar plan to get out of this predicament. Nor did we intend on harming each other, no matter what it came down to. Three, the orchestrator boomed, beginning to count down. Everyone simultaneously readied themselves, getting into a heightened battle stance. I had already narrowed down which opponent I would be going for first, the giant Pine Runner. I was most familiar with his power levels and abilities, I hadn't seen the full extent of the others. It would be most efficient to take out the weakest of the opponents first, and then dealing with the more complex and powerful ones once they were done with. Not to mention, focusing on one opponent would allow time to pass for the others to go after each other, weakening or killing them and making it easier for Arya and I to finish this battle faster. 2. There is a pause. The orchestrator holds up one of his scaly hands, clenching his webbed fingers into a fist. The audience had roared and shouted, eagerly looking down at all of us, begging for the event to start. One. All eight of us charged at each other, the battle beginning with no one slowing down or standing back. Truth be told, I was out of my element. I didn't have trees or structures to climb which had always been a combat strategy that I used to my advantage. But here, that was not an option. But I would still do everything in my power to come back out on top, despite the setback. Arya had truly unleashed her inner Wendigo during the fight, lunging at Genjin first, the biggest and arguably the most powerful of us all. At least at first glance. I admired her bravery, her spirit, all this time of teaching her when violence was necessary had paid off. She was no less of a terrifying titan of strength and speed than when I had met her. Genjin used his sword to wave Arya back, taking a few steps and attempting to deter her. But Arya simply outmaneuvered the giant before her, pouncing onto his chest and going for a bite near his neck area. Genjin quickly dropped his sword and placed his hands at both the bottom and top of Arya's jaw doing everything he could in order to stop her from clamping down and subsequently ending his life. I was caught off guard by the super-sized pine runner, the texture of his needles pressed against my skin as he grabbed me from behind, picking me up over his head and slamming into the ground with a malicious fury. 
The Pine Runner then tried to follow up his attack by joining his two fists together and bringing them down. Except, I used my reflexes to my advantage and I moved out of the way. He still hit the material of the ground, cracking it, and temporarily trapping the lower half of his arms underneath, two split chunks of the floor. I dived forward at him, grabbing him by the neck and yanking him in the direction behind me, freeing him from his temporary predicament. He slid what should have been face first along the floor beneath us about 15 feet. When I came over to follow up my attack, he flipped over onto his back with surprising speed, holding his arms out. A blow of his nearly hitting me in the chest before I swiftly evaded it. I slashed twice in response, cutting off the pine runner's left arm and causing that well-known mossy green blood to ooze from the stomp. This did not deter him from continuing to fight, however. He reacted by lifting himself up and shoulder bashing me mercilessly before I could continue my barrage of cutting him off. Luckily, I didn't slam into the energy barrier, but what occurred instead wasn't much better. Due to the force with which I was hit, my body was sent soaring across the arena, in the direction of where most of the fighting was going on. Arya still bravely taking on Genshin and seemingly winning. Thaw was in a scuffle with the blue tiger. The body of the creature had leaped forward at her, causing the middle head to bite her in the leg and thrash around. She screamed in pure agony, blood falling from the source of her wound. But she didn't go down easily. She fought back by transforming her right arm into the blue flame and decapitating the head that had her locked in its jaws. Furthermore, when I had finally finished flying through the air and landed roughly on the arena floor, I was suddenly stopped from moving after getting to my feet by what felt like some sort of thick, liquid-like substance locking my arms together, making it difficult to move properly. I turned to my right, laying my eyes upon the black sludge girl. She stared me down with nothing but pure and utter excitement as if I were her favorite meal, sat right in front of her for the taking. I groaned and growled as I pulled and forced my arms against the black sludge wrapped around them. It was stronger than any substance I had come across yet. I could feel every tendon burning as I forced my way through. I was able to break through after a considerable struggle, quickly moving out of the way as the girl drew her arms in front of her and attempted to blast me with more of the sludge. I got down on all fours, zigzagging, jumping, and ducking underneath each blast, as if they were slower versions of bullets, which they almost seemed to be. No, you're supposed to play with me, she screams frustratedly, black colored tears beginning to form in her eyes. I made it close enough to grab her, lifting her up by the back of her dress to eye level, using my other claw to restrain both her arms to prevent her from using her abilities any further. I know she wasn't actually human. It was clear as day that she only wanted to hurt and kill me, but I couldn't help but hesitate, feeling unable to inflict any serious harm on the humanoid child. Please, keep yourself at bay and I will not harm you. I promise, I say slowly, to which she responds by simply spitting in my face making me pay dearly for my lack of action. You're very stupid, she teases as the black sludge wraps itself around my eyes. I reach my claws towards my face in order to rip it off, only to crash face first into the ground by a heavy blow to my back. Tree friend, tree friend, the girl cheers, alluding to the giant pine runner being the culprit. But it was obvious before that, considering that I could still smell him. He was far from finished with me. With his remaining arm, he continues to punch me in the back of the head and deliver blow after blow. I sink further and further into the arena floor, as the sludge keeps itself wrapped around my eyes. But luckily, all my other senses were still usable. No, leave me alone already, meanie fire lady. I hear the black sludge girl shout. There is a struggle above, but being repeatedly punched in it further into the ground makes it difficult for me to pinpoint the details. All I know is that Thaw came to assist me, and she was clearly winning against the black sludge girl. Soon, she screams violently, 
a scream of pain coupled with unbridled terror. It is clear that whatever had transpired was not in her favor. Using just my sense of smell and hearing, I turned myself onto my back, still being pummeled by the massive pine runner and slightly dazed from all the punishment that I had taken up to this point. I grabbed one of the broken up chunks on the ground, a particularly sizable one, using my hearing to pinpoint where the danger was. The smell of pine is strong coming from directly above, and I throw the chunk of material in front of me, and it seems to connect. Due to the fact that I hear multiple hasty and powerful steps vibrate through the arena floor, I buy myself enough time to get to my feet. Still blinded by the sludge, I dive forward, latching myself onto the pine runner. I could feel the needles from his skin sticking out against me, but not penetrating my tissue. The force at which I had impacted him generated enough momentum for the behemoth to fall onto his back, with me still on his torso. As soon as he impacts, I slash and swipe my claws around the area of his head, which seems to work out well, due to the fact that I felt his body beginning to go limp as a result. Here, I'm here, Bron. I hear the voice of Thaw say below me. She presumably transforms her arm into the blue flame, burning the black sludge right off my face and allowing me to regain my vision and see everything else that had unfolded around me. You are a true warrior. I thank you for helping me. And I tell her, grateful for her intervention, but can't help to slow my speech as I lay eyes upon the aftermath. Behind Thaw, I see the body of the girl, her neck slightly charred due to being exposed to such high temperatures. I can pick up the scent of burnt flesh as well coming from the corpse. It was truly one of the first times that I had stopped in the heat of the battle to think about what had transpired. Part of me felt anger replacing my gratitude for Thaw's assistance. Seeing the headless body of what resembled a young human unsettled me. One of the few things that did over the past decades. I had seen men die back at the agency all the time. All sorts of cryptids and malevolent beings sprawled out after being torn to shreds. This was different. However, I know there wasn't an extended period of time to think about it. Arya, John, and Jenny all needed my help. Especially the latter two. Braun! Thaw shouted. We need to return to eliminate the others. There is no time. So far, the Pine Runner, the Black Sludge Girl, and the Tiger had all been eliminated from the brawl. It was just Arya, Thaw, Constrictor, Genjin, and I left. Which meant that I had to shake off the dizziness that I felt and keep going. I couldn't afford to rest. Not even for a second. I saw Arya still in an intense grapple with Genjin. But it appeared that the tables had turned, and it was Genjin who had been getting the upper hand. Throwing a fury of explosive punches at Arya, shaking the ground beneath us with each impact, Constrictor was beginning to slither over to join what had been going on between the two, his Y-shaped tongue emerging from between his razor-sharp fangs. He was fierce in his demeanor, wanting all of us to know he was highly dangerous and not to be taken lightly. I dropped down and began sprinting across the arena in order to help Arya. My joints and muscles still ate from what I had endured, but it wasn't enough to stop me. It wouldn't be long before it passed. Once clearing the distance, I pounced onto Genjin. He let out a surprised roar, disappointed that I had attacked him in the name of helping Arya. We traded heavy blows. I slashed back and forth at his armor with my claws and I dived between his legs, quickly turning around and jumping onto his back and ripping off the last remaining pieces of his chest plate. Constrictor had made it over and began to fight with Arya, attempting to lunge and bite her with his fangs, only for Arya to grab and throw him to the side, following it up by leaping onto him and wrestling with his human-shaped hands. No, no, get off of me, blue man. Genjin continued to bellow trying to shake me off his back, only to scream as I sank both my claws and near his shoulder blades. Once I determined my claws were deep enough, I pulled. He began to fall and tumble to the ground on his back. I then rapidly retracted my claws and climbed up past his shoulders, onto his torso, and finally jumped off before he could make contact with the ground. 
Once Thaw had arrived, she had assisted me without hesitation, turning both her arms into the blue flames and taking out both of Genjin's legs. He howled out the most horrendous scream of pain that I had ever heard, before being finished. The smell of burning flesh now as strong as ever. Arya was still holding her own with a constrictor. He turned and went in for a tail whip, only for Arya to grab a said tail and then sink her teeth into it, causing Constrictor to writhe and thrash around in response to the obvious agony. Excited about the move, the crowd chanted Arya's name from the stands. With the match now dwindling in length, Thaw began to suddenly turn on me, going for a blow at my head, but I counterattacked by leaning backward and going for a quick slash at her throat in order to end her, only for her to deflect it with one of her blue flame arms. The fire itself did not burn my skin. As stated previously, fire does not bother me, but it seemed that she also possessed great physical strength and durability, making us both snarl as we pushed each other for the upper hand. No, oh, Braun, she chuckles. Sorry that I have to do this. You're a worthy opponent, but I will be the true champion. You will not be the end of my legacy. And as she said it, any sense of her previous affection for me quickly faded as we engaged each other. I don't respond. Instead, I take the opportunity to reach down and grab her by the feet, turning and slinging her as hard as I can. She is sent well over a hundred feet towards one of the energy walls, seemingly to her doom, but luckily stopping herself by jamming her blue flame arms into the ground. She slid violently for several feet, before stopping just inches from the energy wall, determined to come back for revenge. And when she glanced back up, I was already making my way toward her, wasting no time as I charged on all fours. She jumped up in the air, performing a front flip as she sent herself over my body mass, landing elegantly behind me with a sinister smile on her face. Even behind me, I still detected her scent, so I knew exactly where she was. Thaw attempted to strike me in the waist area, only for me to quickly turn around and deflect her blow, going in for an uppercut-like slice with my left claw. She was quicker, tilting herself to the side just in time. She somersaulted backwards as I tried to grab her, my fingernails mere inches from her flesh as she did so. You're experienced, it shows, but it still won't be enough to kill me, she taunts crossing her arms into an X shape in front of her chest. Instead of going directly forward, I altered my strategy, opting to confuse her with my intention of attack. I dropped to all floors once again, charging forward for most of the gap until I veered to the right at the very last second, reaching out my left claw and impaling her through the chest as I passed by, stopping once I knew she was too weak to continue the battle. Her armor wasn't enough to protect her, with her now sinking herself further and further under my claws, blood began to bubble its way up into her mouth, resulting in thaw choking and gasping for relief as her life slowly slipped away. I'm sorry, I told her into her dying eyes. It was between you and my friends. I will always choose those who have been loyal and honest to me. The orchestrator will be given justice. I then reached over and impaled her through the head with my opposite claw, ending her instantly and getting rid of her suffering. Her last sounds soon ceasing, as I feel myself make contact with the texture of her head. I let her body fall from my claws afterward, her figure lifeless as it hit the floor. I can't help but feel some amount of guilt. If circumstances were different, I would have surely spared her. As long as she had shown me the same mercy, of course. But now, only three remained. Me, Arya, and Constrictor. Constrictor had now shown why his mouth had been previously covered. Because when Arya was too efficient at deflecting his more generic melee attacks, he resorted to spitting some sort of yellow-colored textured acid at her. The first three attempts were unsuccessful as Arya had moved out of the way and had evaded them perfectly. But Constrictor had lunged forward and spit a fourth time, catching Arya off guard, and some of the acid landing on her shoulder. Arya howled, lifting a claw to hold her injured body part, and giving Constrictor the opportunity to follow up with an uninterrupted attack. 
seeing Arya in such pain, seeing her scream and moan so violently, it truly set off my rage unlike anything else. I could feel every ounce of my being urging me to tear Constrictor's throat out and devour it as he watched. I went on all fours and ran faster than I had ever run before. Nothing but violent intentions swirling around inside me. Just before Constrictor could clamp his jaws down on Arya's snout, I barreled through the both of them, grabbing Constrictor and holding them away. He slithered and fought as well as he could, even attempting tail whipping me but to no avail. But even in my more weakened state, my strength was far too overwhelming for him, especially when coupled with my heightened anger. You will pay for that. I bare my teeth, slinking my claws into Constrictor's skin and dragging him up along his abdomen. His mouth opens as he screeches, getting ready to hurl more acid at Arya and me. I throw him onto his back, his human hands attempting to reach and grab whatever they could as I mounted his belly. I animalistically began to bite and tear, pulling away at his flesh and organs as I sank my teeth and claws into his tissue. Constrictor's screams only lasted for mere seconds before death gripped a hold of him. His writhing and desperate efforts of slithering away ceased as the creatures in the seats above began to chant my name. They went on and on, the intensity of their volume only increasing as I finished my gruesome and spine-chilling execution of Constrictor. I stopped, pausing for a moment as I looked down at what I had done, reducing a once fierce and cunning killer into nothing more but just a mess. Blood stained itself on my claws and teeth and I stood back up, turning to face Arya. For nearly any creature, it would be hard to understand her expressions, but after spending so much time around her, I had been able to pick up on what she was attempting to display. And it was shock, not greatly. She is a wendigo after all, but I had never displayed such unfiltered brutality in front of her. I truly had let more of my monstrous urges take a hold in the moment. Thank you, Bron, she says, inching closer. The stench of everything intensifies and it fills my nostrils, and not just constrictors, but all the other creatures in the arena who had died in combat as well. Arya's stare of gratitude is intense more than ever before, her sunken eyes almost burrowing into mine, as we both stand speechless. Well, it appears there is more to these two champions than we all know, the orchestrator announced, focusing his gaze down on me as he gripped the arms of his chair with his webbed fingers. But there can only be one champion, he continues. So, the inevitable must take place. Both of you cannot be victors simultaneously. I walked closer toward the energy wall, still making sure to keep my distance, looking the orchestrator directly in his reptilian eyes as I pointed one of my blood-covered fingernails forward. I will not kill Arya. I will subdue every guard, defeat every creature, and destroy every being you command before I strike her even once. She is my friend, I proclaimed, no ounce of hesitance in my voice. Only confidence. The spectators all began to fall silent. The tension rising in the arena as they all waited for what was to come next. I will not hurt Bronn. I will never hurt Bronn. He saved me. I love... Arya stops, being interrupted by the orchestrator waving a webbed hand as he responded to our convictions. I see. Well, I must say you two surely are impressive. Truly relentless with hearts of gold. You are warriors of passion. And for that, I commend you. But I promised all those who reside here a new champion. So, I will propose an alternative. I myself will come down into the arena. I will not acquire any weapon or shield, just like you two. And I will battle one of you, should I win. You will both have to remain here in the Annihilation Realm and continue to be my contenders. However, should I be defeated, I will have my most proficient sorcerer enhance your abilities far beyond what they are now, 
and you will be returned to your homeworld in order to deal with your conflict. This battle will not be to the death, but whoever forces their opponent to yield first will be declared the victor. As much sense as this made, I didn't have time to wait any longer to get back on Earth and help John and Jenny. We needed to return as soon as possible. So instead, I hatched an idea. I will accept your proposal to battle you, I declared, stepping closer in the orchestrator's direction. But you must do something for me. And that would be... The orchestrator leans in my direction, anticipation leaking from his eyes, being extremely pleased by the revelation. First, you will bring this sorcerer of yours out here, prove his existence and if he is capable, and then you will command him to send Arya home, back to Earth, back to where she can help my friends while we brawl. And should you keep your word, I will fight you. The spectators all cheer, one in particular, who seemed to be a human octopus hybrid, and he swung his tentacles frantically around. His excitement was made quite clear. The rest were just as enthusiastic, all celebrating in their own unique mannerisms. Very well, the orchestrator posits dramatically. He orders two of the hulking, red-skinned guards to enter one of the larger-sized tunnels, to which they obey without question. This will be purely between you and I, Braun, says the orchestrator, a weaponless battle to make the other surrender. As you said, I remind him, not caring that he seems irritated at corrected his statement in front of the entire arena. Both of the guards return from the tunnel, accompanied them as a short, stubby-legged, fish-like creature. His skin, as yellow as you know what, and his eyes as white as snow. I could even spot gills on the lower side of his neck. First, he demonstrates his ability on one of the guards, causing him to be teleported out of the arena and going elsewhere and then suddenly reappearing and seemingly unharmed. The sorcerer marches towards Arya, reaching out a hand as if to touch her. She gets defensive at first, raising her claws as if about to strike. But I step in, giving her a glance that tells her it is nothing to be fearful about. The sorcerer's scaly fingers make contact with Arya's left arm. Although she is still quite hesitant, I make sure to stand close enough to comfort her but not enough to interfere with the magic taking place. The sorcerer recited a spell in a language even I didn't understand, despite being able to understand a multitude of them due to the way that I was designed. A light red aura began to surround Arya, circling in the motion of a tornado as it moved. She stood mostly still, with the exception of turning her skull towards me, her stare more passionate than any time previously. Help John and Jenny as best as you can. They need it. I promise I will join you soon. I will come home and we will defeat Yubel. All of us together. You are my friend and always will be. I can feel Arya's sorrow as she begins to disappear and return back to Earth. I tilt my head toward the floor of the arena. My fist loosening as I let my claw spread open. In a few more movements of the colorful whirlpool-like event... Arya is finally gone, dissipated like smoke from a fire. I say nothing, the crowd of spectators mimicking my lack of dialogue. The sorcerer looks unimpressed, turning to exit the arena as the orchestrator has stepped down onto the floor only several feet away, not sharing my current dejection. The crowd begins to excite themselves once again, cheering for our fight to begin. I simply turn around and stare the orchestrator down. My blood boiling. There was a chance I could perhaps lose, and that would be the likely demise of the beings that I hold dear. I knew that, which gave me all the more drive to make sure I came out victorious. The crowd urged us on. They all shouted, not picking a clear side as to who they were rooting for. Well then, Braun, the orchestrator begins. Let us all see how battle-tested you truly are.